Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I begin in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, dearest viewers. I welcome you all to this fresh new series being launched by Al Islah on the all important and very crucial theme of dispelling the darkness of Ghulu with the light of Quran and the authentic teachings of the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt والسلام, which have been preserved for us in the earliest original sources. One of the most inconvenient truths that one encounters when one studies the history and the origin and development and evolution of Shiaism across the centuries is that a lot of very well-established popular Shia beliefs and practices today which are regarded as being non-negotiable and integral parts of Shia belief and practice, if you go far back into the classical period, the 3rd and 4th and 2nd century Hijri, you find <clears throat> that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt living at that time, and also their companions and the sc classical scholars who came after them, they used to hold and view a lot of the beliefs and practices that have become central to Shiism today. The Imams and their companions and the classical Shia scholars used to view them as deviation. They used to label them as ghulu, as extreme uh, ideological deviation. And this is a very shocking and disturbing fact for those who are not uh, aware of this or for those who encounter it the first time. But actually, for scholars at the highest level of study and research, this is a well-established fact that's hardly contested. The interesting thing, as you will see in the series, is that even traditional scholars do not deny or dispute this. Uh, the example uh, that we give is of Ayatollah Sheikh Abdullah al-Mam Qani, a massively learned scholar of al rajal a traditional scholar, a teacher of great traditional scholars, famous traditional scholars like Ayatollah Sayyid Shihab al-Din al-Mar'ashi al-Najafi and others. Uh, Ayatollah al-Mamqani in his 39-volume encyclopedia on Ilm al-Rijal, which unfortunately a lot of people don't study and don't bother to read because it's so voluminous. But throughout this encyclopedia, repeatedly, not just in one place, but repeatedly, he stresses and emphasizes this fact. And in his words, that he uses in volume two of this encyclopedia in the special section he has on al fawaid al rijaliya he puts it like this he says akthar ma yu'add al yawm min daruriyat al madhhab fi awsaf al a'immati alayhim as salam kan al qawl bihi ma'dudan fi al ahd al sabiq min al ghulu wa al irtifa he says indeed majority of what is considered to be among the core non-negotiable foundational beliefs of the Shia Madhab today, the Daruriyat al-Madhab, the unique sectarian claims and beliefs of the Shia Madhab. Majority of these claims and these beliefs, particularly in relation to the attributes and descriptions of the Imams and their supernatural powers especially, these beliefs which have become so central and well established and popular and established today that they are being regarded as being the cornerstone, cornerstones of the Shia Madhab in the past, fil ahd is sabiq If you go far back into the past, into the 3rd century, the 4th century, even the 5th and 6th centuries, you find the classical Shia scholars used to regard them as ghulu, which is deviant ideological extremism, and irtifa, which is a term Ayatollah Mamkani uses. Uh, again, it's a classical term used to refer to ghulu as well. It's a synonym of ghulu and it refers to blasphemy and heretical uh, exaggeration. So this is a very disturbing reality that one is confronted with. It is well known to scholars and members of the academia, but it's the general public that's blissfully unaware about this. And I feel a lot more needs to be done to familiarize and educate and enlighten the members of our general public with this world war that is raging between the classical school of Shiism and the present day contemporary traditional Shiism, which is the byproduct and the offshoot of 
the Safavid era, and other politically tumultuous eras during which all kinds of un-Islamic beliefs and practices and innovations crept into Shi'ism for political, social, sometimes even economic reasons, and how they became mainstreamed later on, and today they are being accepted as gospel truth within the Shia communities, even though the reality is that when one puts these beliefs and practices under the scanner and the microscope of the Qur'an and the original authenticated teachings of the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt والسلام, one discovers to one's shock that these things are actually labelled as deviation in the earliest sources. We're talking about practices such as making du'as or supplicating to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt with the belief that Allah has empowered them with the power to listen to people's prayers and supplications and respond to them to relieve distress, to remove misfortune and calamity by the permission of Allah. All of these things that have become so popular, when one goes back into the distant past, and sometimes not even the very distant past, uh, you can even see pre-modern scholars like, for example, Sayyid Ali Bahr al-Ulum, Al-Tabatabai and Najafi in his book Al-Burhan Al-Qatir Fi Sharh Al-Mukhtasar Al-Nafi' by Al-Allam Al-Hilli He writes very clearly about what today is known as the belief of Al-Wilaya Taqwiniyya and the idea that Allah has given the Imams the power to create and to give rizq and to give life and to give death all of it bi-ithnillah with the permission of Allah Sayyid Ali Bahr Al-Ulum this great Shia scholar labels this as kufr. He does open the kfir of all Shias who believe in this because he says this is the belief of the ghulat who are cursed by the Imams. This is a belief that is denied repeatedly by the Quran which projects Allah as the sole controller of rizq and hayat and maut and nushur uh, and all these universal functions that are given to the Imams under the banner and umbrella of al wilayah taqwiniyya. So you find Beliefs like al wilayah Taqwiniyya, beliefs like the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have supernatural powers that Allah has given them and that they can hear our pleas and our supplications and they can witness all our deeds and that they have the knowledge of the unseen and basically all of the sifat of Allah and all of the unique divine offices and powers and exclusive attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have been transferred to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt uh, under the pretext that it is Allah who has given them these as honors. Uh, the classical Shia scholars maintain that this is deviation because the Imams never claim this and the narrations we have in which the Imams do appear to be claiming all of this are actually riddled with ghulat and notorious mufawwida. These are deviant uh, fringe group elements who are mass producing and fabricating narrations and attributing them to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt the Imams of Ahlul Bayt warned their Shia against these hadith fabricators, as you will see through the course of this series, insha'Allah ta'ala. A lot of really path-breaking and groundbreaking researches, reformist researches, have been shared and insha'Allah will be con uh, continuously shared uh, for as long as we have the opportunity to do so. Uh, my appeal to all those who are watching this is to listen to all of this evidence, to examine it critically. Uh, ultimately, you can neither blindly follow the classical Shia scholars, nor can you blindly follow the contemporary ones. In Aqidah, Taqlid is Haram, as all the scholars agree. You are on your own. You have to examine the evidences, the proofs. You have to insist on having clear-cut proofs from the authorized sources of guidance which are the Qur'an, and according to the Ahlul Bayt, those of their narrations which agree with the Qur'an and find support and explicit confirmation and endorsement in the Qur'an, those are the sources of guidance that we have at our disposal. And inshallah, in this series, we examine, we try to explore everything in light of these two sources, especially and particularly the Qur'an, which the Imams of Ahlul Bayt promoted as the only uh, powerful tool and vasila that we can use to sort out and filter out all of the lies 
and fabrications that have been attributed to them in the books of Hadith. We have been warned that sharing this kind of research may draw and may trigger a lot of negative and hostile feedback and criticism. In the past, great scholars in Maraja who have attempted to draw the public's attention to these issues have faced a lot of condemnation, a lot of criticism, character assassination, uh, a lot of hate has been sent their way. And so we are conscious of the fact that these discussions may not be viewed positively by each and every single person, but ultimately we do not care too much about the public reaction as long as we are presenting the truth as we know it best. And ultimately, we are motivated in doing this by one thing and one thing alone. And that is clearing ourselves of blame in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for not sharing these researches. These truths and these researches that we present have been lying buried in our books. There are suppressed evidences and proofs and statements and warnings from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, which are largely suppressed. They are discussed at the highest levels, but they do not manage to percolate and find their way down to the public, as a result of which our public is in the dark and it is vulnerable and susceptible to a lot of khurafat that are currently being promoted and peddled by the mimbar and the pulpit. So alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the existence of platforms like Al-Islah, which promote alternative scholarly, especially and particularly reformist perspectives. Uh, ultimately, I believe that all scholars should, have, should be given the opportunity and all researchers should be given the opportunity to share their researches and to share what they have discovered in their journey of exploration into the earliest sources. And then ultimately the public should be left with the freedom to decide in light of the aql and intellect that Allah has given them and the book that Allah has empowered them with as the ultimate furqan and criterion. The public, the public should have the right to decide what they find most convincing and what they're going to follow. Because ultimately on the Day of Judgment, the Quran assures us that we will not be allowed to hide behind anyone's back. And no one has our back on the Day of Judgment. وَمَا لَكُم مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مِن وَلِيٍ وَلَا نَصِيرٍ As Allah repeatedly reminds us in the Qur'an, you have no helper and protector other than Allah on the Day of Judgment. And that is why we should make sincere efforts to try and find out what guidance we can rely on, what is known to be from Allah with certainty, and what is not known to be with certainty, what is dubious, what is shady, what is dodgy, what is shaky and based on hearsay or anecdotal evidence or conjecture or wishful thinking. All of these kinds of evidences and proofs and arguments should be avoided by all those who are sincere and serious about saving themselves from blame in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ultimately, these researches are sincere nasa'ah that we present to the people. This is a matter of najat, it is a matter of salvation. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt have themselves warned us that no shafa'a will be offered to those who fall into ghulu, into ideological extremism and deviation. And they have also defined ghulu in a way that really uh, sounds very scary because they say in their definition of ghulu, they used to define Ghulu as making any claim about them which they have not made about themselves. So that requires us to go back into the original sources and see what they actually said about themselves and what claims they denied about themselves. You will find that a lot of the claims that are so popular about them today that have become well established and firmly entrenched in the psyche of the people a lot of these claims have been explicitly denied by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Claims like they can provide rizq with Allah's permission and that they can respond to supplications with Allah's permission and that they control all the affairs of the universe and witness everything and have knowledge of everything by Allah's permission. 
All of these are claims that they have vociferously and vehemently rejected and repudiated and denied in the earliest original sources. And the Quran confirms the narrations in which they do that. So what remains for us is to then realign and recalibrate our beliefs and practices in light of what is supported by the Quran and what is confirmed by their actual original teachings preserved for us in the earliest sources and to jettison and <clears throat> abandon everything and anything that is not supported by solid proof even if we have inherited it from our forefathers and even if centuries of practice supports it and even if the traditional scholarly establishment does not frown upon it or look down upon it or explicitly condemn it at times because of its fear of the ramifications and consequences that this would generate. So ultimately we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to accept the truth when we see it and to base our deen and our practice and our belief as well on solid, rock solid guidance that we know to be from him with certainty, guidance that he has enshrined for us in the clear bayinat, clear verses of the Quran and the clear teachings of the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt In uridu illa al-islaha mustata'at, the whole motivation of this enterprise is islah, its reform and rectification and correction of all things that have that are wrong and that have deviated from where Allah and his Prophet and these great Imams would want them to be. So in Uridu Islah in Uridu illa Islah Mastabatu as Allah shows us Prophet Shuaib saying in the Quran this is the mantra of all those who seek to bring reform in, in society that we desire Islah we desire correction and rectification. Mastata'atu, as much as we can. Wama tawfiqi illa billahi. Our tawfiq only comes from Allah. Alayhi tawakkaltu. On him we rely, in him we put our trust. Wa ilayhi unib. And to him we have to return. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.